Hey guys, Mike here from Lunch Money Comics along with Jeff from Comic Spa. Oh, sorry, I'll do it. <laughs> do you want to say it? You can say it yourself. Comic Spa. <laughs> hey Mike. Uh, hey Mike. Comic Spa here. Hey, no, let me say Mike first. <laughs> hey guys, Mike here from Lunch Money Comics along with Comic Spa. And I, we are in Concord, New Hampshire at the. What's it called? I'm, I'm dying here. Hey guys, Mike here from Lunch Money Comics along with Jeff from Comic Spa. And we are at the Old School Comic Show in Concord, New Hampshire. By all accounts, this is an amazing comic book show. Let's go find out for ourselves. Perfect. Two more golden tickets, Mr. Brian. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Alright. But we gotta go, you gotta go to, uh, we'll have to take it, and then we'll go to, I gotta go to see this. Wow. Yes. Same question. You yeah, want to sign I would have been in the back. I'd get everyone to sign that one. It'd be really, really cool eventually. Yeah, this is what I, other than organizing it. Yeah. Hey guys, Jim Starlin. How cool is that? Hey, nice to meet you. Appreciate it. Big fan. Hey, hey, good yourself. I'm doing excellent. You work in this book with everyone else in the world, right? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Al Milgram, guys. Hey. <laughs> Hey. Good to see you, man. Hey, thanks for coming out. Yeah. Much money. Kid from Amazing Comics. Pretty cool. Pretty awesome show. Yeah, great show so far. I'm best, pretty excited. Best show in New England. Best show in New England. Yeah. Wow, you heard it here first, guys. I'm pretty excited. Good to see you. No way. Pretty awesome book. <laughs> Didn't mean to catch you in the camera. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't look good. Oh, your staples are clean. Yeah, you just got Jay this Jay Chandler right on it. Look at it. My, luckily, my guy who cleans Press's books came with me, so I can always ask him, but uh, I think that's a good deal. Yeah, I think that was calling for a nine or nine two. All this stuff just laying here. Man, it's so neat. Oh. That's cool. Oh. A little Captain Marvel. Crazy.
Wow, that's incredible. It's only like 20 graded. Is it really? Yeah, it's rare. I didn't know that. Like I told, I had a buddy out in Chicago. I was like, hey, see if you can find it because he went to C2E2 and <laughs> yeah. all the big ones. He's like, I'm here with my buddy Matt, who just got an incredible book. What do we have here, Matt? This is the Keen Detective uh, Funnies, number 23. It's the first appearance of Airman. First appearance of Airman? That is an awesome book. 1940? Yep. Beautiful. Congrats. Yep. I'm not going to eat for two weeks now. <laughs> Welcome to Lunch Money Comics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did? Yes. So this is probably the most incredible comic book show I've ever been to in terms of the quality of the books. I mean, there are Amazing Fantasy 15s everywhere. Just incredibly big, amazing books. I've gotten some small ones, but I've done my rounds. I've spotted a couple big ones. It's just which ones do I pull the trigger on? I don't know. Let's see. Danielle, a handful of people, um, just about kind of their love for comics. Where are you? Right around the coast, right near Canadian National Park. So All right, guys, that was the most incredible comic book show we've ever been to. A lot of books. Unbelievable. I got some really good stuff, spent way too much money. Can't wait to go home and show you guys what I found. <laughs> so there you go, guys. That was the old school comic show in Concord, New Hampshire. And as you heard me say in that last clip, it really was the best comic book show I've ever been to. And listen, I go to lots of these shows, guys, and, you know, they have comic books, of course, but a lot of times these places have non-comic book things, right? They'll have toys, collectibles, Funko Pops, they'll have, you know, artists, writers, they have cosplayers, sometimes they have actors, but not this place. No, this was all comic books and all really, really, really good comic books at that. You guys saw in the footage, I mean, they had stuff in cases, guys, that looked like it belonged in a museum, except this was a museum you could buy. Um, the Silver Age stuff, I mean, yeah, every Silver Age grail, major key was there represented in every type of grade you could possibly imagine and raw and they were all there again i saw like four or five you know amazing fantasy 15s it was nuts but the most impressive thing to me was the golden age books because um these are really expensive books anyways guys you don't often see like the really big dealers but there were some dealers who had an entire like shelf full of golden age superman and batman like all the yellow covers there um, there's a whole case full of, you know, 1940s Captain America, tons of pre-code horror stuff and everything in between. It was absolutely incredible to behold. But of course, all these books were, you know, thousands, sometimes tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Um, it was pretty incredible. So I did buy some books and um, I had a heads up from a couple of people that this was the type of show it was. It was a comic collector's comic show and I should probably bring a little bit of extra money uh, because there'd be good stuff there so that's what I did but I want to give you guys my quick impressions of this before I show you guys the books I ended up with because I think I have sort of a different take um this is lunch money comics right I'm all about buying comic books cheap I didn't grow up with a lot of money and that was sort of what my channel is about I don't think you have to spend a lot of money to build a really good comic book collection. And uh, the reason I kind of started my channel was that I wanted it to sort of be a counterpoint to a lot of the other, you know, um, YouTube channels out there where people are talking about expensive books or investing in comic books. And there's nothing wrong with that at all, at all. And I love watching those guys. It's just that I wanted to show something from, you know, an everyman standpoint, right? The everyman collector, which in my mind, was what most people are. We don't have the money to buy these expensive books. We just buy things in dollar bins and find them at flea markets. That's what I thought was normal until I went to this show. This is the first time, guys, where I felt uh, tiny. I felt small. I felt like, what am I trying to do with my channel? What I thought was the norm maybe isn't. Maybe this around me is the norm. You know, I was looking around seeing people spend thousands of dollars on comic books. At one point, you know, I was really going back and forth uh, on this $75 comic book that I really wanted. And I just couldn't justify spending the $75 in my pocket to pay for this comic book. And while I'm like agonizing over this decision of $75, the guy next to me buys a $5,000 Golden Age book. And I had this sort of mini existential crisis. I felt insecure. I felt humbled. What am I doing here? But then the best part of the show happened, and that was the people. So People kept coming up to me at the show who had watched the channel and they knew who I was. And I would say, guys, like two dozen people came up to me uh, to shake my hand and introduce themselves and have a conversation. And these people were awesome. I mean, you know, every single person I met, it felt like I had been friends with this person forever. 
and I was reminded by all these people of something I had momentarily forgotten, that it doesn't matter how you collect comic books. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter how much money you spend on them or how little money you spend on them. Most people who love comic books, guys, we all love them for the same exact reasons. And all of us, every single person there was happy. Everyone was happy and in a great mood. And I was reminded of what an awesome community we are a part of. What an awesome hobby that we all share with one another. It didn't matter if that person was holding, you know, cheap $1 books or in multiple cases, them holding multi-thousand dollar books in their arms while telling me they liked watching me hunt at flea markets and antique shops. It was pretty awesome and uh, it really made me feel like I did belong there. So if you were one of those people who found me at this show, who uh, took the time to stop and, uh, and you know, shake my hand, uh, a million thank yous, guys. It was really cool. It's the best part about having a YouTube channel uh, is interacting with all of you. So I don't remember all of your names, um, but you know who you are. Thank you so much for stopping by to say hi. Um, I do want to give a couple shout outs to specific people. First, uh, thank you to Nishan at His and Her Comics for giving me uh, the golden tickets. That was pretty cool. We got an extra like uh, raffle ticket because of it. Uh, special thanks to Jeff from Comic Spa who went with me. I mention Jeff all the time on my channel, guys. He is the best cleaner and presser of comic books that I know. I always put a link down in my description to his contact information. If you want the best of the best, definitely seek out Jeff. Um, also, special thanks to Kit Henry from Amazing Comics, who really tipped me off um, to what kind of show this was and told me to bring a little bit extra cash. Happy I did. Thanks, Kit. And it was good seeing you there as well. And also a special thanks uh, for Brendan at The Collector Without Fear. Uh, he has an Instagram account where he goes around to these shows and, uh, and he films people. He interviews people, whether they be writers, artists, uh, vendors, anyone who is in the hobby, and he posts them on his Instagram account. He's a really cool guy. I talked to him for like 45 minutes. Uh, he also took a picture of me, which you can see as my thumbnail. It was really nice to have like a real photographer uh, get my thumbnail. So thank you once again, Brendan, for all of that. So guys, before I show you the books that I got at this show, if you like this stuff, go down, hit that like button, uh, leave me a comment, feel free to share my channel with other people. Uh, you can subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, you can follow me on Instagram under lunchmoneycomics at G. All right, let me show you guys the comic books I got at the best comic book show I've ever been to. So let's talk about the obvious uh, couple of guys that you guys saw in the footage. Um, I got to meet uh, Jim Starlin first. Jim Starlin, very, very famous comic writer and artist, mostly known as the creator of Thanos. And um, I knew he was going to be there. In fact, uh, CGC and CBCS were also there witnessing signatures if anyone wanted to submit things uh, for the signature programs, which uh, Jeff from Comic Spot did. Um, I didn't really want to do that. I just had a couple of books that I wanted uh, him to sign as well as Al Milgram, I'll talk about in a second. So the first book that I had Jim Starlin sign was this. This is Captain Marvel number 33 from 1974. And this tells the origin story and background of Thanos. It's written by and drawn by Jim Starlin, very famous, uh, iconic Jim Starlin looking Thanos right there. And as you can see, very prominently, Jim signed this book, really obviously. Now, no, I was so busy talking to Jim, I didn't specify which marker for him to use. This is a really dark cover, and he signed his name with a black marker on the bottom. You can barely see it. I know it's there. It's fine. Um, just in retrospect, I kind of wish I told him to use like a gold or a silver pen. Still, pretty cool. I thought it was a neat book for him to sign. This is for my personal collection. I wasn't going to grade it or anything. Really liked having it. And by the way, whenever I have anything signed, I usually put like a little card of the place it was signed and then I write down who, where, and when it was signed just as sort of like my own little, uh, you know, certificate of authenticity. So a very cool thing for Jim to sign here. But I had him sign another thing as well. You guys saw it in the footage. Uh, I've mentioned this book multiple times in my channel. I'll put a link to the last time I talked about it up here. But this Heroes for Hope um, X-Men book was basically for famine relief in East Africa in the 80s. And everybody who's a who's who in comic books worked on this book, whether as a writer, penciler, inker, inker, letterer, or colorist, everybody worked on this book. I think it's an awesome book because you can see all the artistic styles change every couple of pages as different teams of people worked on this book. And one of the people that worked on this book, of course, was Jim Starlin. I brought this book up and he told me that he actually, the only work he did on this book, uh, not only was he helping to put the whole book together and organize it, but he did work on the back cover. So you can see he signed it right there. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. And my intent, guys, on this is that every time I go to a comic book show, I'm going to carry this with me and see how many signatures um, I can get from people who worked in this book. Obviously, not all these people are still with us, but uh, a lot of them still are, and I bump into them at shows. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to get this master uh, comic book signed by all these people, and I'll just keep a running tally of everyone who signed it. Speaking of which, let's talk about the next person you saw in that footage. 
Mr. Al Milgram. So Al Milgram's an artist that I know primarily from his work on Spectacular Spider-Man in the 80s. He also created the villain The Spot, someone I really like and I've talked about on my channel in the past. And the best part about Al, guys, was that he was an incredibly friendly guy, very social. I mean, every person that went up to them, you know, he shook their hand, learned their name, and then told them a story about the book he was signing. And uh, I was certainly not the exception. I showed him this book and he went ahead and told me a five minute story all about working on this book. Uh, and then at the end of it, after Al signed this, you know, he shook my hand again and said, you know, nice to meet you, Mike. He remembered my name from five minutes before. Very, very nice guy. And I'm very happy to add that signature right here, guys. So two signatures down, dozens more to go. We'll see how many I can get, but I think it's a pretty cool thing. And uh, yeah, it was really nice meeting both of those guys. Okay, so let's talk about the comic books that I got at the show. I like to start with the cheapest books and work my way up to the most expensive. So let's start right here with Silver Surfer number 34. This is from volume three from 1990, written by Jim Starlin, art by Ron Lim. And the significance here is that this is the return and resurrection of Thanos. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but Thanos wasn't around in the 80s like at all. Yeah, not at all, really. He basically was, you know, created by Starlin in the early 70s. All of his big storylines up to this point happened in the 70s where he fought, you know, people like Captain Marvel or, um, you know, Adam Warlock. But at the end of the 70s, Thanos dies, and he only makes one appearance in the 80s, and that was in the Captain Marvel graphic novel. And even then, he was like a ghost that came out of the Soul Stone. So not around for a decade. A lot of people don't realize that until he was resurrected by Starlin in this story right here. And why is that significant? Well, this begins the whole story arc that led into the Infinity Gauntlet story, um, which obviously I don't need to tell you guys is not only hugely important for comic books, but also its huge impact on pop culture because basically the entire MCU and its Infinity Saga was based on uh, this incarnation of Thanos. And this is the Thanos I knew and loved when I was growing up in the early 90s. So I actually got this book, guys, with the intent of having Jim Starlin sign it, and I completely forgot I bought it. I didn't even remember I had this until I got home and opened up my bag and said, oh yeah, I was going to have him sign this book. That's okay. Still a cool book. I've never owned it before. It was pretty cheap. Happy to pick it up. This next book I got from the same vendor. It was sort of a package deal. And uh, I got this book basically for one reason. I owe one person uh, for getting this book, and that is Alex the Comic Hoarder. So for those of you who don't know Alex, and most of you who are watching this channel, I'm assuming you do, Alex is another uh, comic book YouTuber. He's been a great inspiration to me and my channel. And he did a really cool thing on his channel where he talked about foundational books. It's a term he coined on his own, basically about comic books from specific eras that are iconic, that are well known, that sort of will like level up your collection if you pick them up. And why I love this series so much is that a lot of those, when I watched, you know, those shows, I'd say, oh yeah, I have that one, or ooh, I wish I had that one. And it sort of let me fill in these gaps of like when I was collecting as a kid. And um, he brought this book up. And being primarily a Marvel collector, I never really would have batted an eyelash at this book had he not mentioned it. But this features the first appearance of one of his favorite characters, all right, what am I talking about? It's this. DC Comics Presents number 87. It's from 1985. And this is the first appearance of Superboy Prime. So Superboy Prime uh, comes from Earth Prime, an, an alternate Earth. You can see here as part of the uh, Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline. And uh, basically Earth Prime is a alternate Earth where superheroes are actually like comic book superheroes, like they're superheroes in comic books, uh, except for Superboy Prime. Superboy Prime is a uh, counter-Earth version of... Kal-El, Superman. Uh, long story short, at the end of this storyline, Earth Prime is destroyed and um, Superboy Prime is like the only survivor. He basically becomes corrupted and turns evil and becomes basically Superman Prime, an evil version of Superman. So he's a very, very cool character. I don't blame Alex for really liking this character. Um, it's just the concept of an evil Superman, I think, uh, is alluring to everybody. Uh, still, I never own this book, guys, and being primarily a Marvel collector, I'm always happy to add sort of cheaper DC keys to my collection to sort of even it out. And this one here was listed at $25, and you see the Silver Surfer was 10 so I got them as a package deal for 30 bucks. I thought that was a great deal to uh, get these books and add them to my collection. So uh, very cool first appearance of Superboy Prime. Thanks very much to Alex the Comic Quarter for putting this foundational book on my radar and into my collection. Ah, uh, so this next book is awesome. I've wanted this for a long time. Here it is. This is Captain America number 109. It's from 1968, written by Stan Lee, art by Jack Kirby, and this is a retelling of the origin of Captain America which I'm pretty sure everybody uh, knows by now. Very iconic Jack Kirby cover of Cap bursting through this World War II uh, newspaper. Now, I've wanted this comic book for a long time simply because 
of the cover. It's awesome. It's iconic. I thought it looked great like on the wall behind me. I've always loved this. But in high grade, this book can be kind of pricey. Well, would it surprise you that I got this for $30? Well, originally it was listed at $40 and the guy was able to sell it to me for 30. And uh, you know, the corners are sharp, the staples are great. How did I get it so cheap? Well, you might not be able to see from there, but let me go a little closer. You can see it's actually pretty heavily stained. Now where the stain is, you know, overlapping the newspaper, it's hard to even tell. It almost looks intentional, but it does overlap like his shield and a little bit of Cap's shoulder, which when you turn it at an angle, you can see not only stain the book, but also cause it to pucker a little bit and you know, the pages are a little bit raised, but I don't care. This is a fantastic looking book. I'm ecstatic to pick this up for $30 and add it to my collection. I think it presents really, really great. Certainly when I put it on my shelf behind me, you guys won't be able to tell it's stained. So very happy to get this for 30 bucks, guys. Captain America 109, awesome, awesome Jack Kirby art. So we've come to the last two books that I got at this comic book show, and both of them are rather expensive. Like I said earlier, people sort of tip me off to what kind of comic book show this was, how there'd be a lot of higher end books. And I thought like if I was going to the show, I could probably afford one really nice book to add to my collection. And uh, to do that, basically I sold some non-comic collectibles to have some extra cash in my pocket, not just for this show, but like other shows I'm going to in flea market season starting. And again, my intent was to get one good book to add to my collection. As fate would have it, I got two for reasons I'm about to explain in a second. But this first book I'm gonna show you is actually the more expensive of the two, and it's an X-Men book. Now, for anyone who watches my channel, I say it pretty much in every video, X-Men is my favorite franchise, and I'm trying to fill in the entire Chris Claremont run on X-Men, basically from issue 94 all the way to the high 200, 16 years on X-Men, I'm trying to fill it in. And the most expensive book of that whole run is issue number 94. Well, I'm just gonna jump into it right now, guys. Here it is, this is X-Men number 94 from 1975, written by Chris Claremont, art by Dave Cockrum. And this is a rather expensive book. For me to explain why this is significant, let me give you the briefest of histories on the X-Men. It's created by Stan Lee in 1963, runs for 66 issues of unique stories until the X-Men stop being that popular. In which case they basically print reprints of X-Men stories with different covers from issue 67 to 93. Until 1975 when Len Wein and Dave Cockrum come up with a new team of X-Men in Giant Size X-Men number one, my favorite comic book of all time, where you get the first appearances of Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Thunderbird, second full appearance of Wolverine in the new team of X-Men. After Giant Size X-Men number one, they start the numbering of X-Men all over again uh, with number 94. So this book right here is the first main X-Men book with a unique story in like five years. And it's the first one featuring the new team of X-Men. Again, we're not counting Giant Size X-Men. Number one in this, we're talking the actual X-Men uh, series. So that's why this book is so expensive. This is the second appearance of Colossus, Nightcrawler, Storm, uh, third full appearance of Wolverine, fourth if you count uh, his cameo in Hulk 180. And most important to me, it is the first uh, issue that Chris Claremont wrote in his historical 16 year run on the X-Men. Now, I thought this would be the last book I got to fill in this run, um, unless I stumbled upon a really good deal. And today was the day that good deal presented itself. I saw this book. Um, it was actually being sold by um, Little Giant um, Comics, um, which is basically uh, the sponsor of this show. They're out of Salem, New Hampshire. And one of the guys at that booth actually recognized me. They had fantastic books. Um, so I was able to negotiate a good price for this book. And you see, they think it's a 5.0 or a 5.5. They had it listed for $400 and I got it for $350. Um, guys, that's a lot of lunch money. It is. That's way outside my comfort zone of what I usually spend on comic books. But again, this is one I absolutely need for my personal collection. And I was very happy to get it for that. Now, the best part about this is, you know, they're saying it's a 5 or a 5.0. There's some color breaks in this corner, but otherwise everything else on this is pressable. Um, I actually had Comics Bob with me to look at this book when I bought it. And he said, oh yeah, it's going to press out great. So I think this is going to look fantastic when all is said and done. So again, I thought it was gonna be the last book that I got. Um, nope, it's, uh, I have it now. I only have a couple dozen left in the run. I'm very happy to get 94 out of the way, uh, so to speak. So there you go, guys. X-Men number 94, a very, very historic and expensive uh, X-Men book, but I'm very happy to add it finally to my collection. Awesome. And now we come to the last book. X-Men 94 should have been should have been the end, guys. Should have been the book I bought and walked out happy. But there were so many good books, guys, and there was one book that just kept speaking to me. I actually looked at multiple copies at different vendors. All of them were roughly the same condition, same price, before I finally settled in this one. You guys saw it in the footage 
Oh, man, I couldn't say no to it. This is Strange Adventures number 205. It is from 1967, and it is the first appearance of Dead Man. Okay, so I am a Marvel guy primarily, but the DC characters I like the most are the weird ones, right? I don't love the big, you know, uh, the big gods of, of DC, you know, the Supermans and the Wonder Womans. I like the weird, quirky characters like Spectre, who I've been collecting like crazy, and also someone like Dead Man. He's a very cool character because he's a ghost. Basically, he was a circus acrobat that was murdered. Um, a god turns him into a ghost that can take over the bodies of other people. So weird, right? Really weird character. Um, also recently in the last like couple decades has appeared in Justice League Dark, basically a superhero team of supernatural uh, themed uh, heroes like um, Zatanna, Constantine, Swamp Thing, and Dead Man. So uh, I think he's a really cool character with a really cool design, but mostly guys, I love this cover. So Dead Man is mostly known uh, being drawn by Neil Adams, but Neil Adams actually picked up this series and, and drawing Dead Man after this first issue. This first one is done by our Carmine Infantino, and um, I just love it. I don't know what it is about it. I mean, he's got a cool design anyways, but the trade dress that looks kind of creepy, horror themed, plus this kind of uh, putrid colored background, this pea green kind of thing. It lo just looks fantastic. And guys, sometimes you look at a comic book and you have to have it. And that was the case here. Um, the price on this was $300. You see that it was listed as VG. Um, and it does have some minor issues, but I was able to get it for $250. And I'm very happy to get it in my collection for this price. Now, I mentioned it has a couple issues. It sure does. Uh, the most notable one is that the top staple, it's attached, it's tight, but there is a little bit of separation on the front cover at the staple. You can see a little bit of uh, daylight. Also, uh, it's hard for you to see, but right here on the cover, there's a little bit of a stain. It's actually kind of pink. It almost looks like candy. Um, it's more evident on the back where there is a similar stain. Now, I think Jeff from Comic Spot can clean this up a bit, but it doesn't really matter because you can't really see it. Um, it presents really good. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of color breaks. Some of the other uh, copies I looked at did have a lot more color breaks. So I think it presents great. I still think it's a great value for that. Now, I don't often talk about speculation on my channel very often. Um, I got this book because I think he's a cool character, but he is one of those weird, quirky characters I could see make an appearance in the new, you know, James Gunn DCU. And uh, he's just weird enough. Uh, I feel like he would be a really cool and kind of macabre and funny character to see on the silver screen. I don't really think this book's gonna go up too much in value if he does make an appearance. The point I'm trying to make is I don't think this book will go down. It's an older book, guys. It's from the Silver Age. It's a key, um, it's significant, and I just don't see it like losing its value over time. Uh, on the contrary, I think it'll, it'll at least maintain, if not go up. Very happy to add this to my collection for $250. Let me know if there's any Dead Man fans out there, guys, and tell me, uh, let me know if you think I got a good deal on this, guys. Oh, absolutely love this cover. Very happy to add this to my DC collection. So there you go, guys. That was the greatest comic book show I've ever been to. Head on down to the comments and let me know what you think of the footage. What do you think of the comic books that you saw? Also, let me know which of my pickups you like the best. Uh, let me know about these books I had signed by uh, Jim Starlin and Al Milgram. Um, were they good choices? I'm pretty excited to see how far I can get uh, getting this one filled out. Uh, or was one of your favorite one of these? Was it the uh, first appearance of Superboy Prime? Thanks, Alex, uh, for the tip on that one. Uh, was it this Resurrection of Thanos by Jim Starlin that, that I never had signed? Was it this uh, retelling of the origin of Captain America in this amazing Jack Kirby cover? Or was it one of these really too expensive ones, guys? Uh, this X-Men 94, which I desperately needed for my X-Men collection, or this Strange Adventures 205. Um, listen, this is a book I knew I'd always own one day, and this first appearance of Dead Man, one I never anticipated. Certainly when I woke up on this day, I did not expect to be walking out of this show with this book. But man, guys, I tell you, I'm very happy with all my pickups. Um, as my friend Matt said so eloquently in that footage, um, this is a lot of lunch money and I'm not going to be eating for a while, but I budgeted for it. I'm very happy. Uh, let me know what you guys think of all of these. So in the meantime, guys, I hope you keep hunting for comic books in strange and unusual places, as well as amazingly epic comic book shows like this one. Uh, special thanks to everyone who I met at the show, who took the time to, you know, walk over to me, shake my hand, introduce themselves, and tell me you're a fan of the show. Um, Thank you so much for that, guys. You made me feel really included. It felt like I belonged at a big show like this. So uh, thanks to the rest of you for watching this, and I'll see you guys next time.